Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here with another episode of Beyond the Board, and I have two very special guests today. I have Mitch Reed and Doug Glover. Gentlemen, would you like to introduce yourselves? Mitch, you start. Hi, I'm Doug Glover, and I'm from the Lead Pursuit Podcast. And he's the funniest guy he knows. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm real happy to be here. Hi, I'm Mitch Reed. I flew in the Air Force, or actually I sat in the back of an airplane and told pilots what to do for my whole career, and now I play war games and get paid to do it. You didn't mention No Dice, No Glory. Oh, uh, and I forgot No Dice, No Glory. All right, you got me. Okay, so we're here, Liz. What's up? Uh, I am here to talk to both of you, uh, goofballs that you are, uh, because <laughs> you are both in the military, you have extensive hobbyist war game experience, and you know some things about professional war gaming as well, especially you, Mitch. So tell us a bit about the kind of work that you've been doing in that area. Well, that's a great question, Liz. Uh, thank you for asking it. Um, I, I retired from the Air Force a few years ago, and I guess I couldn't really find a real job. So I became a government civilian, and I did some stuff by helping standing up Space Force, which I got to be honest with you, the TV show was a lot better than that job. And I got a call saying, do you want to come and do Air Force War Gaming? Uh, so that was about two years ago. And what I do is I develop, uh, plan, execute, and then um, analyze war games for the Department of Defense that goes into buying some really cool stuff. Or not buying some really cool stuff. So to what extent are the war games that you develop actually cool? Are they professional simulations? Are they something like what we would play in Hobby World? What are we looking at? So that's a great question. Uh, I should stop saying that because they're all going to be great questions coming from you. The, um, you know, I know a lot of war gamers out there. And, you know, when we're playing... Blood Red Skies, we could pretend that we're Eric Hartman or Richard Bong, which is one of the greatest names of any aviator ever. But when you get into what how the DoD does wargaming, I can tell you this, it's not fun, especially after a day like today. And a lot of it is because, you know, we're looking at 20 years out. We're looking at future weapon systems. Uh, you know, we're looking at adversaries that, and I am not telling anything that's classified, but you can look up the day named Dave Ogmanic from Rand, we lose a lot in war games. And like we like to say, all war games are bad, but some are useful. So it, it's, you know, if a lot of people out there feel like, well, I, you know, I play Squad Leader, or I play, you know, all these games, I could be a DoD war gamer because it sounds like fun. Look, I find it's fun for me, but I can have fun in the closet by myself. It's, it's some of it is really dry. And a lot of it, too, a lot of it is, you know, you have 30, 50, almost 100 years of DoD wargaming, and it really hasn't moved up with the times. If you were to come to one of our war games, you'd see about 400 people. They're planning. They're executing. You would think, like, well, this is the Department of Defense. Couldn't they use, like, touch screens or visual display? No. You know, sometimes we use a map. Um, and we play out the war game. It's I'm trying to infuse fun in war games. And um, I've been successful with a game that we developed called Truman, uh, which is a, a competition game. There's no war in it. It is before conflict how, like, U.S. in the Indo-PACOM region will play against Red to put themselves in a position of advantage for a future conflict. And I made the game fun. Um, have you guys ever played Twilight Struggle or heard of that game? Of no, course, no, no. it's a classic. It's a classic. So we went to Rand, we gave him a copy of Twilight Struggle, and they ran a Plan Blue War game for us, but we needed it more specific. So we took that game and we made it in-depth, and I can send you, Liz, the, the rules that we wrote for it. And we tried to make it fun, and the game got canceled because of this COVID thing. But when we play tested it with all these folks, people enjoyed it. And I noticed that they kind of studied the material a little bit more because of the fun aspect of it. And I think that is something like, I know the guys at CNA and Peter Perla and this, well, it can't be fun. Well, then how do you get folks to do this? Because we run war games, but our, our audience, the, the folks that actually play the game, they have day jobs. 
And we want them coming back and motivated to play these games. Uh, the guy that runs our red team, the adversary, he's proud that he's 24-0 and against Blue, which is the United States. So we just try to put that fun in there. But, you know, other than that, I can tell you the truth. Uh, these war games are long days. And I've fallen asleep in briefings many times. And I think Mitch will also tell you the frustrating things that any gaming group has will apply, that you have gamers who show up woefully underprepared. You have people who don't know how to play their role. And sometimes the questions you are asked to find the answer to through a war game are really stupid, such as, but what if the drug cartels infected sheep with coronavirus and then released them in the middle of a protest? I don't know, somebody, General, but I'm. thank you for asking. <laughs> has somebody been reading the DoD analytic agenda? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wait, is that like a real thing or did you just make that up to be ridiculous? You never know anymore. You mean the, the DoD analytic agenda is a real thing. It is the storyline behind all of our war games. And there's something called the defense planning scenarios, which are supposed to be unclassified. And, you know, I may have a funny story about that, but... We take them, and that's so we have standardization between our game and the Marines and our games and the Army or joint games. Because I can tell you, and Doug, it's not because you're a Marine. I went to a, Mar a Marine Corps planning session for a war game, and I'm like, these guys must be on crack. They weren't. We usually are, actually. So yeah. it's that or a lot of coffee, one or the other. But, you know, and Liz and I will probably talk about this later. Wargaming starts a little bit differently in the Marine Corps as a service, at least amongst the officers, than probably in the Air Force, the Army and other services. It never starts for us. We do, we, we do not have a wargaming culture in, in the Air Force. And we are. I personally am trying to change that. I want folks coming to games motivated. I want them coming to games, not because they're in Hawaii, but because they want a war game because they know how important it is. You know, we always joke around that, you know, well, we save lives. And the only thing that dies in our war games are outdated concepts and doctrine. So when you say a war gaming culture, do you mean a culture where professional war gaming is practiced and respected? Or do you mean a war gaming culture as in you're going to find other hobbyist war gamers in that branch of the military? So the Marine Corps is very different. And, and I will speak from, from my, yeah, besides the fact that we like to eat crayons and we run around and get crawled in the mud and yell at each other. Uh, but from my time as a young lieutenant in the late 1990s, we had what we called tactical decision games. And like any professional organization, there were things you were expected to do. You were expected to subscribe, subscribe to the Marine Corps Gazette because all good officers did that. You were expected to read the tactical decision games in the back and comment with your fellow company grade officers about that and be quizzed on it by your more senior officers. But what it did was these tactical decision games, while very basic war games used to reinforce certain tactical concepts, whether economy of force, unity of command, any any one of those things that you wanted to reinforce at the small unit level, it allowed people to think creatively. And if you were the young officer lieutenant, you had to sit there and say, I have to balance doctrine and tactics with coming up with a crazy solution that you know, my mentor or my field grade officer, someone may look at and go, yeah, yeah we're never going to do that. Because most of us, at least on the, uh, the officer side that have gone through the basic officer course in the Marine Corps, have probably come up with a great idea of how to conduct a squad assault, a platoon assault, company assault. And all of our mentors were like, no, we're not going to do that. We have real bullets that we're shooting out here and we're detonating, you know, small pieces of C4 to simulate artillery. You're going to do, you're going to fight the way we told you to fight. But but the point is, by creating that that culture of wargaming, we were used to thinking tactically and and wargaming out our responses. And that was then taken to the next level with what we called the Marine Air Ground Task Force Staff Planning, uh, where um, this, this group called MSTP would come out and ostensibly host these war games of a variety of types, not necessarily exercises, but true war games, and force a organization staff officers to think through all the actions, all the agencies they had to work with, what were the decision points in a, in a daily basis, so that your daily battle rhythm, you'd wargamed out and you'd, you'd practiced and in a sense trained to and said, all right, I know the three or four things the enemy can do that that I have to be ready at a moment's notice to be able to counter. And that buys me brain space. It, it buys me thinking time. So when a really weird situation comes up, you go, 
wow, I've never seen this in a war game before. I've never seen it in training. Uh, let's all sit around and take 20 minutes to figure out what the right answer is. The war games that you're experiencing are war games that directly prepare you for actual situations that you might encounter in your military career. Well, some of them in the Marine Corps were, and, and, and Mitch can talk about some of the things that he saw in the Air Force, but in the Marine Corps, there there was a lot focused on the young infantry lieutenant. And I say that because we always talk, every Marine is a rifleman, and in a sense, all Marine Corps officers, just like all of our enlisted go through boot camp and some basic infantry and basic warrior training, we do the same as officers. We learn some basic infantry tactics, and we learn how to behave as an infantry platoon leader. And so you learn tactics and ways of thinking there, but they're they're the same concepts that all of a sudden when you are a mission commander and you're trying to figure out how to put eight F-15s from the Air Force with four F-18s from the Marine Corps and four of your buddies flying AV-8 Harriers and maybe two Prowlers from the Navy, the same concepts are still sitting in the back of your brain. You're like, hey, there's this thing called economy of force and, and unity of command and some of these other principles. And well, unity of command means we got to have somebody who's making the decisions. Oh, crap, that's me as the mission commander. Where, where can I be in this strike package of airplanes to do what I had to do as a lieutenant, which is command the force? So I better not be the first guy up the hill. I better be the person who's in the best position to observe and command the force. So it's principles like that that you reinforced over time. I wish I could tell you how envious I am because in the Air Force, we do none of that. Uh, the first time I would say an officer hears about war gaming is Air Command and Staff College. And they do a small game. Actually, it was designed by John Tiller uh, from John Tiller, Tiller Studios. And it's really about pulling on an ATO, an air, ta air tasking order. But, you know, if you're a services officer that's in charge of a mortuary, w that means very little to you. We don't do the war gaming. We tend to do exercises. Um, we tend to train a lot. But when it comes, I think, to war gaming, especially at the operational level, we don't do that. So it goes into your second half of your question. Well, is it about hobby gaming? You know, I, I, I wish the two were, you know, interchangeable skills, but uh, I've met fellow airmen that play war games. Um, hey, do you ever think about becoming an Air Force war gamer? Well, I don't think we do that, you know, as a service. So we are just in a totally different position. And I can tell you this, and I'll admit it now, but a lot of us are envious of the Marines because they have that culture. Um, we don't. So what can you learn from professional level war games, war games in the Marines or in a, a more limited sense in the Air Force that other types of training exercises or classes or just direct giving of information cannot teach you? What is that extra thing that war gaming gives you that makes it worth it? So I think it really comes down to understanding how it is crafted. And in the Marine Corps, at least from my time in aviation, we used to always talk about the difference between exercise design and exercise control when we were just doing a war game. There were no real airplanes flying. There were no real Marines running up a hill, bayoneting dummies at the, at the top of the, the bunker complex. It was simply an exercise in going through a thought process. And the, the, problem was in the Marine Corps, we had organizations that were very good at exercise design. They could, they could craft a series of decision points that would lead you through thought processes and, and would develop innate responses in either a staff or an individual through this war gaming. But then we also had other organizations that were great at exercise control. They could make sure that all the computers were aligned and were in the correct tents and the air conditioning was on and the general's coffee was warm and, and they important. were, they were good. Very important. Thank you. Very, very, very critical there. Very but, but they weren't so good at making a exercise or a war game that caused you to think. And so that was always one of our challenges was, and I said it often to my commanding officers out at the Marine Aviation Weapons uh, School, as I'd say that I can, it's very easy for me to point to an organization in the Marine Corps if you tell me, do you want a well-designed exercise or well-controlled exercise? And I can pick one of the other organization. There's very few, and usually it was personality driven, that could do both, that could both create a very creative and very um, open-ended war game that would test people's decisions, test their, their creative thinking, their critical thinking abilities, yet also be able to set it up so that when you needed to flip the switch in the first hour with the general standing there saying, you're wasting my time, uh, it was all prepared and ready to go. Yeah, and our war games are what we like to call the operational level. Uh, 
the campaign level. And it's the only way that you can play with all the toys in the DOD at one time without spending a lot of gas money. And it's kind of how we put a campaign plan together. And actually, it's a question I'd love to ask Doug is, I've sometimes wondered if wargaming is really important to the Marine Corps because of the fact that they're really a combined arms force. And it's how you guys integrate the flyers, talking to the ground Marines, talking to the Navy. I kind of wonder if, if that's the reason why you guys have that culture or it's so important to you. Well, I, I think it is, and I think you hit on it, because one of the biggest war games that the Marine Corps would traditionally execute was the Weapons and Tactics Instructor course out at Marine Aviation Weapons Tactics Squadron 1, where I was an instructor. And so it really was your chance to put together, let's say, aviators from the East Coast and West Coast of the U.S. and some aviators from Japan and our, our command and control Marines, the Marines that set up all the communications networks and actually manned the computers and the radios to send airplanes to the right battle space. But some of those Marines were from Cherry Point, North Carolina, and some were right down the way from Miramar and some were from 29 Palms, California. So we, because we were a small force, learned that we had to war game together, even if a single airplane never flew, even if a single artillery round was never shot down range, we had to once, twice a year, come together, bring these people who didn't train on a daily basis together and say, we're going to spend three or four days doing a war game. We're probably going to fail miserably. <laughs> we're not going to achieve our objectives, but we're going to get used to working with each other. And and why is that? Well, because unfortunately, when the nation calls on the Marine Corps, it's usually because they're not ready for that conflict. And we as the Marine Corps go, well, I can get some Marines from Camp Lejeune, some Marines from Camp Pendleton, some guys from Miramar, some guys from uh, Cherry Point, put this whole cobbled unit together as, as a combined arms task force and be able to achieve the mission because we can seamlessly operate together, even though we didn't train for weeks and months on end uh, as, a, as a solitary unit. So the last time I talked to somebody about professional wargaming, it was uh, Caitlin Leong, who is a master's student in security studies at Georgetown. And I do not recall her. Having, I believe she's a civilian. So my question is, how? what is the relationship between civilians who are interested in professional wargaming and professional wargaming that's happening inside of the military? Oh, you set me up for one for my rant here. It's It's bad. And that's a problem. Um, as I said, we've been doing this, you know, how long has McCarty Little been around? 120 years, that's with the Navy War Games. Um, but when I go to war gaming planning conferences, it's a lot of guys with gray beards just like myself. And, you know, you need them because you need that experience. What we're not doing is we're not tapping into academia to pull some of these new ideas that will get us to the next level. Um, Rand is a company where I would say that their war gamers are very diverse, very educated. Um, but what they, I think they provide, because they do a lot of stuff for the Air Force, and I got to work with them tomorrow morning, um, is PhD level analysis. We are not, as an organization, pulling in our youth. And that is a problem because, you know, you have, as Caitlin mentioned, connections. And you, you have a lot where we do things with academia. Matter of fact, a professor at Colorado State who taught wargaming at the Air Force Academy reached out to me today. It's like, I really want to help you guys out. And as much as I'd love to get him, and I'm going to talk to him tomorrow, I kind of want his students. Because if I put a problem in front of a group of fighter pilots, I could tell you, other than, you know, it's like, a dog watching TV when you brief them, sorry, um, that I could tell you what their answer is before they give it to me. However, somebody that doesn't have those 20 years of indoctrination into a similar way of thinking, we're, we need those voices at the table. And last year at Connections during the summer, at the last Q&A section, uh, there's somebody that actually supports uh, Marine Corps Wargaming down at Quantico. And I know him, really good guy. And he goes, where are the opportunities for the younger war gamers to kind of bring and push their ideas forward? And somebody goes, well, a thing like connections. But none of them were speakers. 
none of them, you know, were giving demos. So uh, to me, I think that is the big problem, that we're not clearing space for these new people to come up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an old guy that knows that I don't know everything, and I know that I'm not going to be doing this in 10 years. So where is my replacement? Because I still care about the product, and I just don't think we're doing a good job there. So, uh, Doug, you talked about wargaming a lot in terms of it's really a very tactical, battle-specific way. What about war games that are dealing with maybe larger scale global and political conflicts that aren't strictly military exercises? What kind of role are those playing? That's a very interesting subset of a lot of what we do. And it's and it's funny for me as someone who was kind of the, the tactical uh, level instructor that sometimes we in the Marine Corps do a bad job and we cross the streams. And, and I say that because we, it's so hard to teach people good tactical concepts, whether they're flying an airplane, firing an artillery cannon, shooting a rocket-assisted artillery missile, things like that. Um, there's, there's so much time that you have to spend on doing the basics. And unfortunately, in our desire to be a more thought-provoking force, a, a more uh, well-educated force, sometimes that filters down to a level well below decision makers. And it's it's been a problem that we had a number of times to kind of keep pushing back up as as we used to see in a lot of our Middle East themed war games that we're doing, where they kept trying to push down decisions and concepts to an individual squad leader, where we would look at them and say to the to the war gaming team, I appreciate you're trying to inculcate this thinking into them, but those decisions don't play at their level. Theirs is a shoot or don't shoot level. Theirs is a rules of engagement uh, execution level. Theirs is is not a bigger, what's the political impact of my actions? And I think the problem is we we allowed ourselves to muddy that water because of some discussions we had in the Marine Corps about what we called the three block war. And instead of taking away the good from it and realizing that in the three block war, you could be handing out aid packages on one street, you could be doing counterinsurgency on the other and be in a full up firefight with tanks and artillery on the third block. It was, we became this, we have to do everything kind of force. And the problem is we need to understand that infantry need to be good at infantry. Armor needs to be good at armor. We need some commonality, but when we have to do engagement with non-governmental organizations, when we have to do other uh, agency work across the U.S. government, uh, those are skills that are really tough to push down to the lowest echelons. And those kind of war games need to be held initially at a higher command level. And I'll use the example of, of how we had a Marine air group in Afghanistan, where we needed to do that at the very highest command element, because I, I didn't want my young captain or young lieutenant who was on the radio, he or she was making phone calls to get aircraft to Marines or soldiers that were in extremis. I didn't want them to have to sit there and go, Hmm, political implications. I needed them to turn around and go, sir, I think this is the kind of mission we don't need to do or we do need to do. You know, you're, you're the air watch officer, the senior watch officer. Give me the thumbs up. And then it was my responsibility to think about those bigger issues and to, to free them up to execute in a world that was yes or no, that was ones or zeros, um, and to really push some of the decision making to the, to the appropriate level. But that's once again, it's because because we're Americans. We we want to all be the good guy. We want to we, we want to make that right choice. We do, we don't want to cause collateral damage. We don't want to um, to create a political uh, conflict where there doesn't need to be one in, in in what is going on. But the problem is sometimes that slows the decision cycle and causes people to second guess when you really need them to execute at a very very carefully crafted level. So one of the things, and I was going to do another. Um... Ghostbusters reference, because when you said crossing the streams, that's what you were talking about, right? Absolutely. Come on, I'm old enough to be a Ghostbusters guy. <laughs> so for our Truman game, it was what we call a competition game, where the military guys informed the posture in the Indo-PACOM region, which is huge, um, and really kind of built upon what force would we need to fight an adversary there. But the focus of the game was was nation building, was using all the levers of national power. It's called dime, diplomacy, information, military, and economics. So I met 
a little over a year ago, the, the only war gamer or the initial war gamer from the State Department. And having them at one of our war games, because it was at a such a high level, and there was no actual war or conflict happening that you know we needed those type of SMEs. Our war games tend to be at the colonel, general officer level. Um, usually your field grade officers, your lieutenant colonels, your majors and captains are just really kind of doing all the, the grunt work. But we, for that game, had, it was called a Five Eyes game, where we had all the English-speaking nations that are in our Five Eye Alliance. Every team from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Great Britain, the United States was headed by a two-star with a civilian equivalent from either their Department of Defense, Ministry of Defense, or um, their State Department. And we really looked at the political ramifications. How do we work with the other instruments of national power? Um, the military can't do it on its own, and the military doesn't really kind of decide policy. So pulling in the senior State Department people, and if the game actually went off, which it didn't, uh, the senior non-military person was a former ambassador who's the Air Force uh, POLAD, uh, which is a political military affairs type of person. So we do those games at that higher level. And it was kicked off a little over a year ago by the DepSec Dep, who said, we need to know how to win competition, which is the years before a war, to put ourselves in a position of advantage. And I asked all over the DOD, has anybody done this before? Has anybody done a big game? After I got a lot of no's and a lot of good luck, buddy, um, we sat down and wrote one. And my experience in games like um, Twilight Struggle and playing some of those diplomacy type games helped me really build the mechanics for that game. So a lot of what I do as a hobby has helped me out at work. You know, it's it's... One of the things I do enjoy, and that's why I said, look, I'm going to add a little fun into this, but you know, we do game at that higher level. And if you go to some of the big games that the Navy has, that is, you know, a COCOM, like STRATCOM. And they, they own all the nukes. And they war game at that high level. And I was sitting the last time I went up there for the degree game, and I was the Red Air Officer, Russia. So I was the Russian Air Force guy for a war game. And the guy that was the political and military affairs advisor was the former ambassador to the Soviet Union. And, you know, asking that guy a question, he told you how to build a watch, but it was enthralling. So we do try to get a mixture in these games of national intelligence agencies, CIA, that are outside of, of the military, State Department. We try to get these people at a table because when it comes down to the national security strategy of the United States, we all have the same mission. And if the more I know about what they do, the more I can leverage them when I need them. Um, Marines are a great example of that because if you have to evacuate an embassy anywhere in the world, the Marine Corps does that. So they are always at the State Department working on contingency plans. The more you get to know these people by name, the more you have connections with them, the better you'll be able to work in a conflict. Well, and I think you bring up a really good point there that a lot of times at the higher level war games, it's easy to attract the other agencies and to attract their advisors. Even if you don't truly attract one of their decision makers, you can get their gray beards and, and their individuals that are willing to assist you. One of the most frustrating war games I ever participated in my life was preparing to take a Marine Air Group into Afghanistan in 2009 to stand up an entire area of battle space for aviation and ground Marines that would initially be a brigade of Marines and then was going to expand to an entire Marine Expeditionary Force, which is a lot of Marines, and we'll leave it at that. Um, but the problem was the war game we did to step through what we needed to know and needed to understand the command relationships and think about, you know, what kind of decisions points would enemy action give us out there. We had almost no state department. We had zero true allied and coalition players. We had other American Marines playing the coalition, which never works well. Uh, we had, 
a, an Air Force Exchange officer with us performing all the functions of anything that was painted blue that said U.S. Air Force. So if I called for close air support from an Air Force airplane, that officer was that interaction. If I called the Air Operations Center to get yelled at by their colonel on the watch floor for tasking their airplanes, that officer was simulating it. So we, we had a problem that Rather than engaging all of the different agencies and saying, send us your, your subject matter experts, or at least send us someone who knows how your, your, your organization truly functions, we built up a lot of bad habits because we thought we knew what the Department of State representatives were going to do for us. We thought we understood what the variety of NGOs that were out there inside our battle space were actually going to do. And when you have an NGO played by a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, that's terrible. They don't look at the world the same in case people can't figure that out. Yeah, let me uh, let me make you feel worse about that. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so, so you look about multi-domain ops, and you look about do it. You, you you go to execute a war game. Who provided your conduit to space cyber? You're you're guessing at that yeah. point. Yeah, you exactly. Need, you need those folks exactly. at the table. Well, and as we, our problem, and and I've told Liz about this a little bit, is that we had quote subject matter experts who didn't know the rules of engagement. They didn't know how U.S. and NATO rules of engagement were different. And when I'm in there training to be the senior watch officer, the the individual charged with being able to run the entire air war for the Marine Corps in this, in this battle space, it's critical that I understand the rules of engagement. And when I have to correct the wargaming team and say, please go read the special instructions generated by the Air Force because it will tell you exactly what the ROE is, then that 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 breaks the the disbelief. It, it it breaks the the ability for me to sit there and go. I'm going to let myself get so far down in this war game that I'm going to get stressed out and I'm going to to let them push me around because all of a sudden I'm second guessing what they do, realizing they don't know their their own construct and their own mechanics of their own game. Uh, frustrating to say the least. So it sounds like war gaming at the professional level is useful because it's bringing people from different organizations together, hopefully with some shared base knowledge of how things are supposed to work in practice. Uh, but the other thing that I, I mean, I love war games more and more as time goes by, but they're also quite a bit of commitment to really learn and especially learn to play well. How at the professional wargaming level do you streamline games so that they are accessible to people who aren't war gamers, but will still have <laughs> the you know the complexity uh, and the options that are needed to actually simulate something important you lie to them wait no mitch mitch will give you the answer you don't lie to them you have to because i i love doug and i would love doug to come to uh, one of my war games but he would be so bored that he and i would go get in trouble during the day it is it's so different and you know the stakes are a lot higher and then not only is it how do we fight the next war, often in war games you have widget A and widget B. And you have a team of guys that want to buy widget A, a team of guys that want to buy widget B. And your job then is to, and I, I head our adjudication team, or I'm the facilitator for the adjudication team, we have to then see which one performs better. And it could be how the weapon system performs, how it's employed. There's so many different things to it. The other one that people will, and I think Caitlin kind of uh, brought this up a little bit, you got to be good at your maths because you have to be able to take some of the modeling and simulation tools and, you know, that's going to give you a number. And I used to always say, you know, modeling sim is going to tell me a, a PK, percentage of kill, on a missile and on a sunny day. As a war gamer, I then have to take the environment the volume, the velocity, red gets a vote. You'll hear that a lot in games. What is the enemy doing? And I have to take that probability of kill and now adjudicate it and give you a, well, in this situation, this only worked at 52%. Well, no, we want to buy that, son, so it can't be that. So there's a lot of fighting <laughs> with that. But, you know, that's what you'll see at our games. There's, I like to say there's no winners and losers because it's not a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, somebody like Caitlin, who's really into it, who has some great ideas, she enjoys it because she has that, that analyst background, and she understands how modeling and sim work and the different types of, of war games and, and methods of evaluation. But like your average war gamers, I, 
I hear them talk all the time, and I see it on um, Facebook a lot. And they all think they can do the job. Some of them probably could. I don't think they'd enjoy it that much because it, it's, it is kind of dry. Well, I think there's yet another level that this goes down that it's kind of interesting. So we, you, there's a tolerance at the higher levels for analysis, game mechanics, as, as we say, you have to be good at your maths, you know, all those things. There's a tolerance for that. And there absolutely is not at some of the lowest echelons for where you're executing, in a sense, wargaming. And I'll really take an extrapolation of what Mitch said. So let's say we buy Widget A. And let's say Widget A is the AIM-120 Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile. And when it was sold to the U.S., it's a missile that might as well have been a laser. You shoot it, it's going to kill every bad guy. Never going to fail. I think we've even heard that about recent airplanes. The F-35, never going to break. Never going to burn. You know? <laughs> never never going to crash. Oh, wait, we've crashed one. Good buddy of mine. Sorry. Um, but uh, it's, yeah. Hey, hey, he jumped out of it. He gave it back to the taxpayers, as we say. And it, and it wasn't his fault. So mm-hmm. I can I can joke about that. Um, but we, we understand now that this wonder weapon we bought isn't a wonder weapon. It's missed targets in combat. It's it's missed targets in training. So how do you take that that knowledge and how do you apply that to a tactical level war game? Well, it used to be years ago in air to air training, uh, you kind of would tell your bandits, you'd say, hey, you guys are going to be flying the red air. You're going to simulate the bad guys we're trying to shoot down. Um, we're going to call kills on you after we've shot you. And a couple of those, you will do what we would call a Monte Carlo. You would just say, guess what? That missile didn't work. You'd give them a brevity code over the radio to pass. Uh, and then you would know as the guy that had shot the missile, hmm, that one didn't count. I need to kill that bandit again somehow. And then all of a sudden, somewhere, a nerd got involved. And I'll blame the Navy, because I can I can get away with blaming the Navy on this. Uh, the Navy <laughs> the Navy said, well, we need to simulate a better probability of kill of that weapon system. So if we know that I shoot this air-to-air missile and it works seven out of ten times, we need to make sure that the training officers in training, it only fails, quote, three times. Well, uh, while we're aviators and we fly multi-million dollar aircraft and we're supposed to be good at math, um, we pretty much majored in drinking beer and acting like 12 year olds. So if you're asking me to figure out how three of 10 missiles that I shoot in an engagement fail while I'm flying the airplane, I'm not good at it. So what did we do? We created the range training officer. And that training officer, rather than just listening to what was going on, he started off, he or she started rolling a dice. How do you think that went over in the fighter community? Oh, let me tell you about that. The RTO rolling a die while people are flying fighter jets, shooting simulated missiles. Yeah. So the the guy that is my interface that heads up our adjudication team is an old F-16 A-10 commander, academy grad. I mean, he's your Steve Canyon type fighter pilot. And I said, hey, you know. We're going to have Rand help us. And he said, without flipping a beat, he's like, tell them to leave their effing dice at home. (laughs) But that's true. So so that is a fighter pilot's response. But you know what? Nerds not to be outdone. We're like, we got you guys. We're going to keep making you nerds just like us, but without making you roll dice. So the Navy and the Marine Corps made a probability table. And we we broke it down real simple for guys. We're like, look, you have 10 blocks. You're going to write seven Y's and three N's in there. We don't care what order you write them in. (laughs) So very basic probability. So rather than rolling a dice, they were taking those same odds and they're applying it across 10 shots, 20 shots, 30 shots. Shot table. And you yeah, make a shot table. And so as you started marking through the guys' shots, as their air crew were calling missile shots on the bad guys, you just start lining through and you're like, ooh, I got to an N. And you basically would make a call on the radio and say that, whatever the brevity word was for that missile failing. And the good guys were like, oh, crap. Now we got a bandit. We got to shoot again. And all the red guys are like, yes, we didn't die gloriously. We get to try to dogfight with somebody in close. But but we took that wargaming principle of the odds and rolling dice, and we, quote, unquote, made it cooler for all the aviation guys in the room by making a shot table. And we standardized some of those. Sometimes we let people make their own uh, options. But uh, the intent was to bring some of that that known probabilities from the larger echelon war games down to our daily tactical execution so that every day you flew, you flew with the exact same probability of kill that had been practiced in the higher level war games. And the dice thing freaks people out. So at a game, I developed an RNG. 
So I'd say, okay, give me your numbers. And I would go into the computer and I would hit a button and I would give them a number. And they go, wow, that RNG is really good. I go, yeah, it's a random number generator because you guys don't like dice. Does the same damn thing. So that's how, that's how we bring gaming principles into the too cool for school era of fighter aviation. So Mitch, you talked a bit about how you bring your hobbies gaming life into your professional wargaming. Uh, but does it go the other way? I mean, does being good at professional wargaming translate to hobby games at all? And also, if you've been participating in a pro war simulation all day, is it still fun to go home and play a war game? Or do you have Hell to... Hell yeah. Get oh yeah. Look, I mean, let's be honest. You have a bad day at work, no matter what you do. Gaming's fun. And and it's, it's interesting. Um, after t- my day today, which was a crap day, you know, I'm trying to convince the uh, the unconverted of how to move forward. Long story. Uh, I came home and started playing some John Tiller games on my PC. Just picked some up. You know, I still find it fun because it's so different that it's really not the same. But I, I can tell you, though, from playing a lot of games, I'm like, huh, that's a really good way of, uh, of taking hobby war games and bringing in professional. Actually, yesterday... I talked to Phil Bolter, who's going to be one of the speakers at our roundtable, who's a professional war gamer, and he's designed a ton of games that I have here on my shelf. And we were trying to figure out with such a big region like the Pacific, how do we nug down the battles in the Pacific? And I said, you know, I remember hearing a guy talk about he designed an area move game where they don't use hexes, they use areas and you move troops. And I said, well, how, how do you get the shapes? And the guy was like, well, a lot of it is based on terrain, but I am showing you via this map how what areas are important by how I designed the map. And I I thought about that. I'm like, why can't we use that for ours? So I could pull stuff in like that. But I still I still find gaming fun because, you know, at work, they're not going to have me battle Spitfires against Messerschmitts. You know, I'm not going to play. Verdun at work. Now, I've been taking games, hobby games, into work and getting them to play. But I make sure that I say, you know, there's a little lesson here, too. Like, I try to teach them about mechanics. But I also want them to have a good time and embrace the kind of geek culture that the three of us are just smitten with. Well, you you know, it's interesting. So from where I sit, mine is still very much a tactical level of wargaming. And after beating my head against the wall all day uh, trying to figure out uh, air-to-air tactics or things like that, it's refreshing to walk back into Blood Red Skies where it's not, am I doing, am I in a rolling scissors? Am I in a flat scissors? Am I doing a high or low yo-yo? It is, I'm just moving an airplane. I'm burning advantage. I, you know, things like that. And, and I'll be honest, I I enjoy crossing the streams between military thought I will call it and 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 wargaming and hobby wargaming, especially in areas I have a background in, and and some of them that are fascinating to me uh, when doing aerial combat are games like Blood Red Skies, and some of them are fascinating and frustrating, like Dan Verson's Leader series. Um, but I think the the really interesting part for me is a lot of times figuring out what their mechanic is and trying to see does it really correlate to what individuals do when they actually execute that job and. I know for both Andy Chambers and Dan Verson, they get tired when I ask them the questions of, well, does the mechanic have to be that way? What if we changed it? What if we made it like this? <laughs> and they're finally telling me, that's how I designed the game. I'm like, okay, I'll back off. Um, but but for me, it's it's kind of a learning process of decomposing their construct. And, and why did they choose to represent certain techniques or certain uh, actions the way they did? And, and even Kevin Verson and I were talking the other day about how do you take something that sounds so normal and basic as just an air to ground attack. And how do you give people options? And what do you call those options where people can say, I'm willing to put myself under more stress or expose myself to more fire in order to have a better to hit bonus? You know, how do you, how do you put that into military terminology where you're not just grabbing random terms and throwing it in there? You know, you bring up a good point. The reason why I think their games work, it's because they're designing their own mechanics for fun, for a competition. And Dan Verson, how many how many hours does he have in, in high-performance jets? 
Zero point zero. Right. And it's his <laughs> but he writes the most amazing air games. And it's because he does one of two things as a game developer. You do your research and you, you read books by Boyd, you know, you you know, watch Top Gun seven hundred times, but you but you lurk look at the military terminology. Or you just make it where it's playable and fun and and, and take a wild stab at it. You know, a lot of times when I play certain games, my military background said, well, this is BS because this would never happen like this. But then I say, it's just a game. Another interesting thing, too, is does if you're a military person, war gamer or not, that's gone through all the tactics, schools, this and that, are you necessarily going to be a better war gamer? And I'm going to say no. How many times have I got my ass handed to me inside one of the leader games because I tried to do something tactical, <laughs> right. which is which is good and bad, you know, and and I think you hit on the point there that the mechanics and the fun of it are more important. However, what is interesting is to me, every game tells a story and the hard part for me is when my personal story as a retired U.S. Marine interacts with the game and I go man, that game doesn't tell the story of really what we do as Marines and really what makes us special as Marines and, and why we're not just an Air Force wearing green camouflage. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those kind of things that I, and I think Dan has has learned to tolerate my questions uh, <laughs> when, I, when I ask him things about, hey, why couldn't you do a Marine campaign differently this way? Or why, or why couldn't you add this different way for Marine squadrons to execute in Hornet Leader or in Phantom Leader, any one of those things, um, because I think that that when you play a game, you not only should walk away enjoying it, but you should get, you know, at least a little bit of I don't want to say historical understanding because that always implies a level of simulation, but an understanding of what the big picture concepts are. And to be honest, that's that's why I play a lot of games. I'm kind of like, huh, I don't know a whole lot about Vietnam aviation, so I'm just going to fill my shopping cart full of Vietnam aviation war games and start playing through those. Yeah, and that's why, you know what I don't get? And see, I don't play sci fi or fantasy. I mean, a couple because they're real tight. I'm sorry. You, ha you have a boring life. We know that about no, you. No, but it's like, you know, from designing and working on historical war games where you got to do some research, I sometimes look at the guys that do the fantasy sci fi games that's based on nothing that they can put wherever they want in there. It's unbounded by real life physics. I mean, hell, they have magic in their games that I, I, I kind of wonder like that. Just, there's no challenge there. I could write a novel. And that's ah, really see, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll disagree. And Liz can be sitting there laughing, listening to us fight this one out, because I think there's there's to me and this will show my lack of knowledge as a game designer in fantasy and sci fi genres. But to me, there's really a, two ways of looking at it is you can be totally off on your own plan or you can attempt to tell a what I'll call a historical slash allegorical story. And I'll use Warhammer 40K as the example of this going vastly awry in a miniatures-based war game, where the the original authors really wanted to kind of tell some of the lessons of, of World War II and modern history, but then in the process of doing that, created a grim, dark world where things were so dystopian and so amoral that you lost the message of why it was important to be good, or why it was important to to be the less bad of two evils, <laughs> and and so I think that there's there's a thought process there for some f fantasy and sci-fi gaming that it's simply like writing fantasy or sci-fi. You may be writing an allegorical story, you may be trying to take a historical lesson that is not palatable to your audience, and I think this is extremely important today. That may not be palatable to your audience, but tell them the lessons of history that they need to remember so that we don't make those mistakes again, but take it out of something that has a lot of emotion tied to it. Um, and so I'll, I'll be on my soapbox for a moment and say, I think that's one of the toughest things for us to do as war gamers, because the fantasy group uh, of, of fantasy genre is great about it. Separating your personal morality from the morality that you play in the game, whether it be a board game, whether it be an RPG, whether it be any one of those things, it's easy for them to mentally separate their morality from what they're doing. And we, we have a hard time doing that in historical. And we want to be the good guys. And we want to to not always play the bad guys knowing how bad they really are. And we, and we don't even sometimes want to model those bad decisions. Uh, and I'm obviously being very generic here because I don't, I don't really want to, you know, um, let people, I don't want 
people to think that I'm saying we should do bad things and reward bad decisions in gaming. We should. Uh, evil actions. But but we need we need people to understand why those decisions were made. And we need to understand that to a twisted worldview, those seemed like logical choices for a variety of reasons. Because you can only counter that twisted thinking when you sit there and you go, oh, crap, I realize how it made sense to them. That That's really twisted. But now I understand how to counter that line of thinking. Um, and that's that's how I think some of those things could be very important. That's it. I'm going to go pull out my Malifaux and finally play it for real. <laughs> <laughs> See, what's so funny about this is that my under- my experience of fantasy gaming tends to be things like Gloomhaven or Eon's End or Mage Knight. And what makes those games so fun is that mechanically you can create these really interesting and intricate systems that have a really nice internal logic. And then nobody's going to be like, but why doesn't it operate like the real military? And so I actually think that that freedom is cool because it gives you the opportunity to not only come up with cool storylines, although I've, I have my own thoughts about gaming and narrative, but um, you know, I, I like the ability to create interesting strategic spaces where you can have a gaming experience that's truly about playing a, the game and really enjoying manipulating the parts of that game without the limitations of making it a simulation of something in the real world. Hmm. Well, that's, that's a a huge uh, delineation that a lot of people have a a hard time with is understanding the difference between simulating something and modeling something. And, and I use them for the audience now. We we? are because we normally talk about modeling and simulation as, as disposable words we throw together, but there's, there's something that, that you hit on that's important about modeling how things should work in, in your crafted your world, but I'm not simulating it. I'm not going to make it perfect and, and, and adhere to all the laws that I have sort of written into its existence. Good point. Yeah, because modeling... I have those occasionally. Yeah, every <laughs> once in a while. Every, you know, in every podcast when I do, somebody goes, that's a good question. They go, well, we got to ask one per show. Um yeah, it's and that was something when Caitlin spoke that she she lumped modeling, simulation, wargaming, you know, with exercise. And they're all different things. They serve different things. Um, you know, in a war game, I am grading your decision making first and foremost, and then performance and the efficacy of your force. Um, where modeling and simulation, at the end of the day, I'm coming up with a number between one and 100 uh, for the most part. So there are two different things. Um, you could do modeling and sim without human beings. However, for a war game, you, you kind of need that personal interaction because people have to make decisions. So it's interesting to watch that. That goes back to one of the points that I made earlier about the difference between exercise design and, and how, you, how you might craft a war game or an exercise in the Marine Corps versus control, because one of our frustrations we had so often was with limited aviation resources, limited number of days that you have Marines sitting in the same tent in front of the same computers, all working together, limited, you know, bandwidth of a colonel or a general to say, sir, show up for a day and a half and be our senior mentor and advise our people on what they ought to do. Inside that limited uh, amount of, of gaming area, all of a sudden you have to pack it full of as many recognizable decisions without making it some overly complex series of mechanics of, well, I'm going to pre-script everything. So if they send these two F-15s up here to be a combat air patrol and to guard against enemy fighters, but they don't send these two F-18s over here to do close air support, well, then they're going to fail. And now we're going to have to do a different series of missions. We learned that there was a lot of things that you had to have some generic uh, rules of thumb of what could happen. But you had to let people make those decisions. And you had to say the, the exercise has to be designed to let them go. I put an air to air capable platform up there to defend against the bandits. And I sent a precision bombing platform to close air support. And did it matter whether they sent carriers or hornets to go provide close air support? Sure, as an F-18 Hornet guy, I always got offended if they chose Harriers. But if they chose the right, you know, if they chose a capable platform, that in a sense got us that step and it could free us up to go, okay. Now you've, you've bought your force composition. You sent, you did something different than I would have done, but you sent an air to ground capable platform here. What's going to be the air to air? And they might send the F-18 Hornets there and you go, okay, that's great. Now they've boxed themselves in a corner and I have to change the story because now all they're left with is those air to air F-15 Charlies who want to 
wear their ascots and shoot their watches on their wrist and whatever. And so you'd quickly change the exercise to have another pop-up air to ground threat. And the person would sit there and go, oh, crap. Did I make a bad decision? No, you, you made a decision, but that decision did paint you in the corner of you had no depth to your force. You took your air-to-air and air-to-ground capable platform and you sent them on the, the lone air-to-air mission. You, you painted yourself in the corner. Congratulations, you learned from it. Okay, let's reset. Let's do another mission. So I was going to ask, if you are already okay with alighting certain rules or simplifying a game in order to make it playable in a streamlined way, at, why would it matter whether the game is fantasy, sci-fi, or historical? You mean personally? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. And I think it's just because of if, if you come to my house and there's you see tons and tons of books you'd have to look really hard to find some of the fiction works you know and i yet i studied so, english so it's a matter of personal college. taste i think it's a matter of personal taste i think a lot of it's interesting um i play the heck out of star wars x-wing star wars armada i love those two games i can't get enough does it bother me when i watch x-wing when i watch one of the movies and i'm like well yeah, that's not how uh, astrophysics works. It kills me to no end. You know, like, why aren't they floating? And I, I have to let that go. And I think it's the one thing, I, and Doug probably could agree, the military ins- instills a healthy sense of paranoia and OCD in you. And <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, I'm not sure I'd use the word healthy, maybe un before that, but yes, you're yeah, right. <laughs> you know, because it's, I've never been in a place like you work with nukes. You get one question wrong on a on a fifty question test, you fail. So it's that paranoia and that OCD, and I guess maybe because it's I find hi- I can analyze history, um, I can look at different historical viewpoints and come up with my own. In fantasy, Luke, you know, uh, hand shot first. That there's you know that's the only debate a lot in fantasy, because everything else is pre written, it's pre scripted. Um, Maybe the, and it's personal choice, but I do have a question for you. You mentioned something, Liz. Yeah. You said you said you're getting more and more into war games. I want to hear what games you play. Well, and then Doug I mean, and I could say they suck. No, just kidding. Uh, ha, ha, okay. <laughs> so uh, tell you what, I'll tell you what I'm playing. I'll ask for a recommendation from y'all, and then we will end this night with where we can find you guys on the internet. I think it's a great spot. So war games that I've been playing recently. Um, I guess it depends on how you define war game. I have been spending a lot of time with the coin series. I know that some people find it's war gaming is debatable, but you, I, I could say something that will make you jealous. Oh. I've been to Volko Runke's house to play a game. Oh, that does bro- sound like that would be a good experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you there. it was. Uh, I brought my friend who's a general in the Army, everybody who's CIA, ex-CIA or State Department. I could say I was like the, the idiot in the room, but the coin series is amazing. Which one's your favorite? I'm an ancient history person. So for me, it's between Falling Sky and Pendragon. Basically, if I want... If simple can be used to describe a coin game, if I want to have a simpler experience, I'd choose Falling Sky. If I want to go all the way and really have an intense, complex experience, I will choose Pendragon. I think Pendragon's kind of pushing the limit of what I can handle in terms of game complexity. <laughs> uh, I also do play a lot of David Thompson games. I do. I've got Castle Eater in the in the queue, you, ready to go. What do you think of that game? Uh, I haven't played Castle Eater yet, but I love Havelov's House. I think it's good fun. It's very dramatic and it's exciting. And it always presents you with decisions that are never enough and can, you know, you can even lose the little that you have, which I find enjoyable in games. I'm going to upset you now. I bought that game. I was, believe it or not, I bought it at a complete strategist because if I go into a local game store, I buy something because if I don't, they won't be there the next time I go. And I bought Pavlov's House. Because I'm sitting there reading Board Game Geek, and I'm like, well, the company is an amazing company. They know how to do solo games. I've never played it. Am I a bad person? No. Yes, I mean, yes, you, you are. <laughs> you merely have an opportunity for fun that awaits you. Yeah, I need to play. You're a failure. You, <laughs> I'm going to tell you all the bad things about yourself, Mitch. <laughs> I, I, I do, man. It's, you know, I cry myself to sleep a lot, guys. 
It's not fair. <laughs> You're so sensitive. It's I know. It's not fair. And, you know, thank uh, God that we didn't do the video here because, we, you know, like, remember I said I jumped out of bed to come down here because I forgot that it was the night. And, uh, yeah, so thank you guys for not doing that. <laughs> or Liz. So I've said what I'm playing. Here's what I want from you two is my last question tonight. First of all, what is your favorite war game? And second, if I wanted a uh, taste of something that was as accurate as possible, what war game that is a hobby war game would I play? You ask the worst question to ask any war gamer. It's like asking Sheldon who his favorite physicist is. Um, it, it depends what I'm in the mood for. I have this thing where I look at a game and I say, that's going to be a hot game. And then I play it till I forget I have it. And um, I, I can't say I have a favorite. I know what Doug's answer is, but I can't say I have one because I have an addiction problem like most gamers. And it's almost like heroin. If it's a great game, I'll play it uh, regardless of subject matter because I do play the three fantasy or sci-fi games. But I can't answer that question and, and really be honest. Or I'll lose my sponsorship. Or uh, not just kidding. <laughs> Fair enough. It's hard to choose among all of your children. I know. Yeah. Doug, Doug is yeah, I was Blood Red say, Skies. Are you committed? Now, I am. I am not going to say Blood Red Skies because it is not my favorite. I'm enjoying it right now. I'll be honest. That's why I do a podcast for it, uh, for the Lead Pursuit podcast. But what I will say is, if, if you asked me, what is the most realistic? game and and what would you recommend for someone to go out there and, and to play and to have something that is both accessible and realistic which is always difficult um i i'm going to tell you there isn't an easy answer to that where i started is probably the gateway drug and say things like squad leader panzer blitz and war games like that and you go oh my god those things are so horribly complex and they are in the lens of today but they also had a level of detail that does not exist in so many games today. And, right. a, and a level of, of scientific thought between what is the penetration capability for an 88 long round? What is the armor on the front of a T-34? And those things that caused you to go, wow, I want to step back and I want to have a fun game or I want to really go into this deeply modeled and deeply simulated kind of game. Um, and, the, and that's the reason why I say those are the ones I suggest for a lot of fun, a lot of with the right crowd. Those old Grognard games were great. And what what I did by playing them years ago is I really developed appreciation for simple games <laughs> like Blood Red Skies right. and like the leader series, um, <laughs> because when I want to go just have some mindless fun, I will go play a leader game because it doesn't take long. I'm not going to get bogged down in some tables. But I also know that at the end of the day, when I walk out of there, I had fun. But zero that I did had anything, anything remotely to do with aviation other than pushing aircraft around a board. But that's okay, because I, I wasn't playing it for that. Squad leader, um, man. So that's, mm. yeah. Mm. I, I, I loved my gateway drugs. Mm. Um, Advanced always, squad Always leader. be a favorite of mine. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I'll tell you what, she's asking for a recommendation, and I will do better than a recommendation. I will recommend that you go to MMP, Multi-Man Publishing, pick up one of the ASL starter kits. They're kind of cheap. And it's one box. You play the game. And I will get somebody on Vassal to teach you that game. And they do play it solo. And I will get them to teach you that as well. Uh, matter of fact, he's one of the speakers at Cyber, the Cyber Roundtable that's going to talk about ASL. Because when you see the ASL Advanced Squad Leader rulebook, it's a binder bigger than anyone I had in high school. And it's scary, but it's such an amazing game. And it plays quickly once you know the rules. So, Yeah, it's, it's the graduate level education you need to go through the rule book. That's the problem. But, yeah. and, that's, and that's why I say Squad Leader, Panzer Blitz, uh, some of the older games that are a little bit easier. But, uh, but I, that would, would also be my challenge back to you, Liz, is try some of the old Grognar games if you haven't in a while, knowing what you know now and appreciating what you know now. Uh, and go back to some of the really complex worlds and go, eh. You can still play this and cut about 50% of the BS out of it, and it's still a fun simulation. Yeah, it's good. It's a lot of fun. Eh, binder full of rules. I know no fear. All right, so you can find me on the internet anywhere as Beyond Solitaire. Mitch, where can we find you? Uh, no dice, no glory .com. Um I'm one of the writers. We have a, a big staff. We throw out a lot of uh, podcasts 
And then can I plug my event? Please do. Because both you guys are speaking. So, HMGS, Historical Miniatures Gaming Society, is having Cyber Wars. Um, I am running the round table. I have... Liz, Liz, you're on day one. You're like the last speaker on opening night. I mean, that is like... It's like pitching in the bigs. <laughs> you will regret this. Yes, you can find it on uh, Facebook. Just go to the No Dice, No Glory Facebook page, and there's links, but we have... 20 hours of speakers that cover professional gaming. Um, we have influencers. We have game reviewers. We have a very special treat, I think, for your audience based on this talk is the Canadians developed a COVID game using Vassal that they've only shown to U.S. State Department and uh, my wargaming section here at the Pentagon. They're going to show it to everybody there. We also have uh, Benerson Little who wrote a lot of the Age of Piracy background story for uh, Firelock Games and the TV show, I think, Black Sails. So we have some amazing speakers besides Doug and Liz. And come check it out. Uh, just hit uh, No Dice, No Glory's uh, Facebook link. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Doug, where can we find you? You can find us on the web for the Lead Pursuit podcast, obviously on social media, at Lead Pursuit leadpursuit.net if you want to go out and find us on that archaic thing called the World Wide Web. Uh, and once again, reach out to us on social media. Pretty easy to find the podcast. We're on iTunes, we're on Google, we're on SoundCloud, any major kind of uh, podcasting archive out there. Uh, we're out there. We're irreverent. We say things that make people very, very angry, and we make fun of Warhammer 40K competitive players. So, hey, that's reason enough to come listen to our podcast, right? One of the best podcasts, though, is, is theirs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, again, so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. And for those of you who are listening, happy gaming.